And if you have a Bible, uh, and if you got a smartphone, those that have smartphones, uh, you can pull your first phone out in this church because it's got a Bible on it. Most smartphones have Bibles on them. But the, you bring your Bible, that's great because we want you to follow along with us and understand the scriptures that we're presenting as we come. We'll be looking at Luke 13. Luke 13, the first 17 verses of Luke 13 this morning. But we'll go to the Lord in prayer while you're looking at that. Father, we love you. We thank you for loving us. We thank you that you loved us so much you gave your only son. And you gave us the gift of the Holy Spirit and your word in which we look at today. And we thank you for the guidance and direction it gives us. Thank you, Jesus, for uh, leaving heaven, coming down and placing yourself within the virgin, living 33 and a half years without sin so that you could take our sins upon you that we might obtain your righteousness. And Holy Spirit, oh, we thank you for your presence with us today, that you would guide us and, Lord, lead as we look into your word. And thank you for those who have gathered here to help us be obedient to that which you've called us to do. And, Lord, we pray that you allow this to encourage them and strengthen them and challenge them, Lord, in their walk with you. And, Lord, those that will go out through the Internet, Lord, through the web page, through the Facebook, through the YouTube, Lord, wherever you take this, Lord, we know you have a purpose and we just pray that you are glorified in all for it's in the holy name of Jesus Christ we pray amen thank you <clears throat> just that uh, earlier we been doing this for almost right at three years now and um, the first year we did um, share a lot of scriptures that went along with nature and where we're at in these beautiful uh, cathedrals and tabernacles the Lord's prepared for us out here in the open. And then uh, back in January 2016, the Lord laid on my heart that we, most preachers and most churches were not really focusing so much on what Jesus, they've been focusing on so much of what's happening in the world and trying to counsel people in directions uh, when, and using the scripture somewhat, but we really needed to hear what what Jesus says. So I, we started in January 16 of looking at the words of Jesus. We started with him at 12 years old when he first began to speak and chronologically we have been going through his life. So we come across scriptures anytime you're an expository preacher or a teacher, you come across scriptures that other people haven't heard or even focused on before and sometimes may be controversial. But that's what we're doing and as we're going through the life of Christ, as I said we're about in our, I think, 77th message already on the words of Christ and we got a long ways to go we're getting there probably another year uh, so in this sharing what Christ it says now in the previous chapters before we read the scriptures here I want to bring you up to what is taking place Jesus has been walking and teaching that's the way they got around then they didn't run down the road most people knew their neighbors uh, they didn't have communications like we do but they would walk where they went and people would come out and walk together and they would talk and teach and that's what Jesus has been doing now for almost three years and he's been healing the sick raising the dead but mostly ministering to people teaching teaching his disciples that, that things that they need to know and in the last few chapters as he's been walking and talking I want to bring back to what we've been preaching on the last 10 uh, messages uh, in chapters uh, 11 and 12 is that Jesus had an invitation to come and dine with a Pharisee and they of course uh, criticized him because he didn't ceremonially wash himself as they thought they should he should before dinner and upon that he pronounced six woes upon the scribes Pharisees and lawyers and then right after that in the same setting of pronouncing these six woes he gave five warnings the very distinct warnings to his followers to the disciples and I said we've just finished that part and at this point people are asking Jesus a lot of questions some are good, want to know the oddest answer questions, but others are to set a trap for him. And most of the questions, though, it's very interesting. When you study the words of Jesus, uh, when people asked him questions, he normally answered with a question. Go back and watch it. He normally answered with a question. Why? Because that makes us own the answer to the question. Because we actually, we weren't just told the answer, but we got the answer by 
thinking it out and allowing the Holy Spirit to help us and the research that we would do. So he's answered most of his questions with questions and it helps us in our relationship with him. And as we study his replies, we can learn a lot about him and his ministry and how he expects us and would love for us to live in order to please him. So since Jesus was going toward Jerusalem at this particular time, he, everybody pretty well knows where he's going. Anything that he said about Pilate was sure to get to Pilate before he got there, okay? Because this is a, a governmental problem with the religious and... and but so, but if he ignored the questions that people had about things that were happening, the current issues, the crowd would accuse him of being pro-Roman and disloyal to his people. So he had to be, he had to be the Lord and answer what he needed to answer. And you'll notice this particular question is probably a set up question because he could have answered it and really said something about Pilate and the gov Roman government here, but he doesn't. But he really brings us a message we need to hear. In Luke 13, 1, it says, There were present at that season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 of whom the Tower of Salaam fell and killed them. Do you think they were worse sinners than all the other who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So have you, have you noticed that? How people respond when tragedy happens? Whether it's because a hurricane or an earthquake or a wild shooter shoots. Who gets to blame? God. Why did God let that happen? Why did these people die? People say, God caused this, God caused that. God killed these people because they were evil, so he's taking care of things. Or, you know, the one that really got America's attention was when the Trade Center fell on 9-13, the question was, where was God? Where was God? You know where he was? He was on his throne. Yes, God is in control, and God knows all things, and God is infinite. Thus, he lives in the past, he lives in the present, he lives in the future. He knows all things, and he is all power. There is not, no one, nothing more powerful than God. And as we saw last week when he was uh, talking, he has given us, first of all, a choice. He made us in his image that we have brains to think, and we can make choices. He don't guide us like little robots. And he allows us to make decisions. He allows us to obtain knowledge. And he talked about that. So, hey, you can discern the weather. You can see a cloud coming from the west, and you know it's going to rain. You know, you've got that knowledge. So he gives us that ability to make decisions to put ourselves actually in harm's way. Like maybe getting on a plane or a jet that the small part of the motor may break while you're going through the air. Or to stay in the path of a tornado even though you say, hey, it's coming, but I'm gonna stay here and see what happens. You know, God will take care of me. Okay, God gave you wisdom to get out of the way, right? But you choose to God gives us opportunities to go to a restaurant where there may be a shooter there ready to shoot everybody up. You know, he even gives us opportunities to make the choice to smoke a cigarette, which could cause you cancer. So we know from that, right? I hope you've got the idea that all human tragedies are not a result of God punishing evil. Some are because we, who are made in his likeness, with the opportunities that we have, choose to do these things. 
to put ourselves in harm's way that these things might happen. Yes, you say, well, but, but God did. He, had, he destroyed a lot of evil. Yes, in the Old Testament we read he brought Israel to her knees many times because they, she turned her back on God. Her, their sin against him. And also God destroyed many nations throughout history that came up against Israel. And all of these actions were for his purpose. His purpose. We know that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because of sin. And many question today, living in America, how God has allowed America to be so blessed and to continue. And they say with the way America has gone with homosexual marriage, which is against God and his word and killing of babies before they're born. Why has God not destroyed America as he did Sodom and Gomorrah? It would seem, they say, he owes America or Sodom and Gomorrah an apology. You know? But apparently there's still ten righteous in America. I don't know that. I don't know why he hasn't. You know? There may be. Um, but we know that God is omnipotent. He is infinite. He is all power. And things are working basically as you read the scripture as he says they should. And we know tragedy, God allows tragedy to come in our life that we might learn, that we might grow in our walk and understand who he is. And know more about him. We are to grow. We know this world's not our home. We're not supposed to live forever. And these this questions that Jesus, Jesus asked the disciples there, or those following him, to think about as they begin to ask the questions, why all these tragedies, and, and these were things that really happened. And, uh, but I went back and I thought, well, where's another incident very similar to that? Basically, you go back when uh, <coughs> Jesus... After his crucifixion, he was walking with his disciples, and he had went basically to let Peter know he was forgiven, that he could still minister, even though he had denied the Lord. And he asked him three times, do you love me? And three times, basically, he gave the same answer, go feed my sheep. But Peter, like many of us, okay, the focus is on me. Let's, let's change the focus here. He turned around and saw John. And he said, well, how about John there, you know? And I can turn around, Lord, why are you picking on me? Pick on Tom a little bit there, you know? Uh, that's what Peter was doing. He said, well, how about John? And he said to him in John 21, 22, Jesus said to him, if I will that he remains till I come, what is that to you? Follow me. You follow me. And what's that, that, what is it in my business, what God's doing in Tom's life? You know, you know, God's working in his life. God's working in mine. I need to be accountable for who I am and my testimony. So his message here, as he's reading Luke, is very simple. When we begin to be concerned about others and about the things that are happening around us, he says to us, you repent. Repent or likewise perish. What does repent mean? Repent means that you turn from the path that you are following, which is normally we're following self or Satan or sin or the world, turn from that path that you are following and turn and follow me. Follow the truth. Follow the right path. Because that is where we have eternal life in him. And he was like, well, he's judging. He's judging us. Why would he spin? And, and we know he has. And some things are, probably. We, we, that's not for me to say, or you to say, really. That's what he's saying. And again, why would he spend what little short life we have if you live to be 90 years old? It's short, you know? What time we have on earth? Why would he spend that time that we are growing and learning and building our relationship because we could get ready to spend eternity with him? Why would he spend that time judging us? When he's, we are told in Hebrews 9, 27, and it is appointed for man to die once, but after that, or after this, the judgment. So, he knows there's a time of judgment coming for all mankind. 
this time that we live is a time for us to learn to grow in our relationship with him and he's going to share a little bit more about that in the next two little illustrations we're going to read what these things are that we get so concerned about the destruction of maybe the masses being killed as he said there in galilee the tower falling there they are, and even in our modern history, we hear it every day, no telling what we're going to be on the news tomorrow, where there was a mass shooting or a mass earthquake or a mass fire and people were killed. What these signs all are is a fulfillment of John 3, 19, is that, and then he, Jesus said these words, and this is a condemnation that light is coming to the world. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. That's why we hear these things. The mass killings, the mass hate, the mass abuse. Yes, we are uh, just a sidetrack, yet we as Christians are supposed to try to influence them and do all we can. And we're going to get to that. That's, he's going to actually bring that up. Listen here as we continue in verse 6. As we grow in our walk, our relationship, he goes in verse 6 and he spoke this parable. So this parable has to do with what he's just talking about. Because it says, As he also spoke this parable. So they connect, right? He said, a certain man had a fig tree, planted in his vineyard. And he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of this vineyard, look, for three years I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well, but if not, after that, you can cut it down. Now, according to Leviticus 19, 23, and 25, when a, tr a fruit tree is planted, the first three years of a newly planted tree, the fruit is not supposed to be eaten. Okay, for the first three years, the fruit's not supposed to be eaten. And the fourth year belongs to God, belongs to the Lord. So here's a man, basically he said for three years, so apparently he's gone past the first four years where he has given whatever, and now he's waited three years for fruit after that, and he's had none for seven years. No fruit upon the tree. So he's got a good question. Because as a child we have in our families, child belongs to their parents as their children. But there comes a time when that child becomes an adult. And they become accountable for who they are for their actions. And with a lot of us, God is patient. He's been patient and long-suffering with most of us. But we need to come to a point in our relationship that we are actually sharing the Great Commission. That's what we're supposed to do with others, what he has done for us. So, to put all those actions together, we find that the things that God asks us to do, there is never a time it is wrong to be nice and helpful to others that you can minister and lift up the name of Jesus. As we continue reading in Luke 13, he, it says in verse 10, Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years, and was bent over, and could in no way raise herself up. But when she saw, when he saw, when Jesus saw her, he called her to him, and said to her, Woman, you are loose from your infirmities. And he laid his hands on her immediately. She was made straight and glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath and said to the crowd, There are six days, people, on which men ought to work. And therefore come and be healed on them and not on the Sabbath. And the Lord then answered him and said, Hypocrite. Hypocrite. Okay. You got it? Got it. Does not each one of you on the Sabbath lose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead him away to water it? So ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it, he says, for 18 years, be loosed from the bond on the Sabbath? And when he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame, 
and all the multitude rejoice for the glorious things that were done by him. So again, he says, think about it. Let's think about it. Think about it. How many times have you actually maybe been nicer to a pet than you have to a family member? Maybe to your companion, to a child. How many times have you actually, you know, you're in an ill mood, but you took it out on somebody you love, but then the little animal that you have as a pet comes along and you just love and cuddle it. You feed it, take care of it. How many times have you spoken as we walk in the park here? People greet the animals, the, anim the dogs usually. How many times have we done that but not acknowledge the person? Or acknowledge the stranger maybe somewhere else at a different time? That's what he's saying. While we spend time judging and wearing about all this stuff. Actually, I, as I was trying to find out a close for this, I realized that the five warnings that he gave previously tie into this. The five warnings were first beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Beware of that. Beware of the evil, the falsehood, the, is not, the not truths around us. And then the second was beware of covetous. Beware of lusting and thinking it's all about you. Beware, a third one was a wary. You know, uh, worrying about the present and what's taking place. As he's saying, you want to know why these things happen? Beware of that. It will stunt your spiritual growth. It will rob you of the joy that the Lord has for you. And the fourth one was in Luke 12, 35, beware of carelessness. In other words, Jesus shifts the, the thought from being worried about the present to being watchful for the future. We need to not be so careless with our walk because God is coming back and this is not our home. We've got an eternal home. And then the last one was we used last week was beware of spiritual dullness because he is returning. And our focus in this life should be live, as we say every Sunday, as if Christ died yesterday. He arose this morning is coming back tomorrow. If you have Christ in your life, live in such a way that that joy is in your life, that you're not so burdened about the things, but you're out loving God by loving people, doing good and helpful. There's never a wrong time, even on the Sabbath, to be nice to people. To let God be exalted. So he brings us all together again for us in Luke 13. And he tells us the most important thing we can do first is repent ourselves individually. Bring ourselves before the Lord. Repent to him. Say, Lord, I need you. I need your guidance. I need you in my life. And you turn from these things of the world. And then grow. Produce fruit that, that others can see him in you. And he will be glorified. And remember, it's never wrong to respect somebody. It's never wrong to be nice to that cashier who is frazzled because the line at Walmart is so line, long and they're frazzled and you're, you're frazzled. But it, I don't know how many times I went through the line and I just say, God bless you. You know, just slow down. I'm here. <laughs> God's here. And they, think, they, they ask for me to come through their lines a lot of times if they've got the opportunity just, just because I'm going to respect them. That's what we're supposed to do, right? Wherever we go, be nice, respect people. How can we do that? Because God's here. We belong to Him. We're His. And that's really all that matters, isn't it? He lives, and he's coming again for his church. And I know where my eternal abode is, and I hope you do. If you're here this morning and you don't know that, in just a moment, I'm fixing to close. I'm going to pray. If anything that the Lord has used this vessel here to speak to your heart, and maybe, hopefully it's the Holy Spirit has dealt with you from his word. And as we pray, you pray. And you ask God to work with you in that part of your life, whether it's dealing with some things as a Christian you need to deal with, or if you are not a follower of Christ and he has dealt with you that you need to be a follower of him and he's calling you to him, do it now. 
and when we pray and then afterwards share with us that we can rejoice with you and if you're on the internet on the YouTube or Facebook or any of these places that this is going out share with us there's ways there to communicate with us so we want to rejoice with you what God is doing in your life and if you are a Christian and God's working many great works in your life at this time and and you can see what he's doing we love to hear those stories too and others that you know again love to hear them wherever you're at whenever you're walking the campground when you're at Walmart or wherever people love to hear what God is doing share the goodness of God wherever you go share that relationship because you encourage others but before we close I really want to share with you the scriptures that tells you that we are all sinners and how we can come to know him please allow me just this one moment Romans 6 23 it says for the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life in the Lord Jesus Christ so the wages of sin is death the wages of sin is death. Who sins? Romans 5.12 says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all have sinned. All have sinned. The wages of sin is death. But what did he say in the last part of that verse? But the gift of God is eternal life through the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5, 8 says, But God demonstrated his love toward us, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. How do you get that gift that he died for that you can have? In Romans 10, 9, he says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto salvation, unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture said, whosoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For whosoever calls in the name of the Lord shall be saved. I pray today that you know the Lord Jesus Christ, as I said. If not, find somebody you know who is walking with Christ. Let us rejoice with you, pray with you, and that we can help you grow. Get you a Bible, get you, help you find a church that you can be a part of and, and grow in Him. And again, if you're living for Christ, rejoice and share what he's doing. Live today as Christ died yesterday, that he arose this morning. How exciting that. And that he's coming tomorrow. Because he's coming. And it's very soon. Would you pray with us, Father? We love you and thank you, Lord, for this privilege again to come before your holiness. I thank you for this time. Oh, what a beautiful tabernacle, Lord, you placed us in today. What a... How we are so blessed and we're so thankful, most of all for salvation. And Lord, for these who have come this morning here to this place and uh, allowed us to be obedient to that which you've called us to do. They are such a blessing to us and we pray that you would bless them as in their travels, in their vacation, in their life. Lord, may you be glorified and honored through all of us. For in the holy name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.